We hope you enjoyed this teaching from Christchurch Birmingham. More teaching can be found at www.christchurchbirmingham.org. This is an amazing church. It's just like Jubilee. And it obviously is just like Jubilee because um, Steve and Joe had so much to set the pace and the tone and what Jubilee looks like. Jubilee was very different before they come, but I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, if you've got a Bible, uh, you might want to start turning to or scrolling to Isaiah 61. Um, and I'll be reading verses 1 to 6. If you haven't got a Bible, we'll be projecting it up on the screen later, so no worries. Uh, as Steve said, my name's Raj. If you're a visitor here today, you're really welcome. Keep coming. I've met one visitor today. Um, the church, this church is for everyone, as you can clearly see. Um, um, some of you might be wondering, so Jubilee Church, Teesside, some of you might be wondering, where the heck is Teesside? Well, you may recall the uh, Channel 4 TV series called Benefit Street. They filmed here, didn't they, just on James Turner Street. Well, the connection we have with you is they also filmed it in Stockton, where I'm from, just 10 minutes up the road. So I feel we have a connection already. Short intro, um, I have one wife, uh, Charlotte. We both are part-time GPs. We have three kids, Jess, Jemima, Josiah, and a little dog called Shadow. That's what I kind of, uh, he's my prayer dog. He helps me go out and get out and spend some time. I was born into a loving Indian Hindu family. Uh, my mom used to read me bedtime stories of gods with eight hands and an elephant's head riding into battle on a rat, much better than Netflix or <laughs> Fortnite or whatever else these guys do these days. But ultimately, I came to faith in Jesus just after medical school in the midst of a pretty chaotic lifestyle, um, pretty difficult uh, chaotic lifestyle. God rescued me. In the midst of my mom dying of breast cancer at the age of 50 and my brother ending his life at the age of 28, God consoled me and had compassion on me. In the midst of massive rebellion and arrogance and pride as a junior doctor, God stretched out his long arm and forgave me. Back then I thought church was, uh, back then I thought church was for, for white people who were really good, who behaved themselves. I was neither. A guy called Dan Ortland uh, puts it this way. What if you had a friend at the center of your bullseye of your relationship circle whom you knew would never raise his eyebrows at you, uh, eyebrows at what you share with him, even the worst parts of you? All our human friendships have a limit to what they can, uh, they can withstand. But what if there were a friend with no limit, no ceiling on what he would put up with and still want to be with you? And my discovery is, what if that friend was God? Yeah. If you're not a Christian here this morning, why not? Yeah. It's a good question. Stephen, Joe, Charlotte, and I, as he said, um, go a long way back. They helped me through this discovery of Christianity, as, as it were. I'll let you in on a secret. Steve was our rebel elder. Um, you don't sound very surprised at that. Um, he was the first person in Jubilee to ever come on a Sunday morning in shorts. <gasps> Can you believe it? And the pinnacle of that revolutionary leadership, because it really did change the face of our church, the, 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 the pinnacle of that is when him and a friend of mine, who later became the opposition MP candidate in my area, he wasn't a Christian, decided to spray paint, deface, a controversial, massive street, board, street billboard just outside of our church in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. morning. 3 a.m. on the morning, on a Sunday morning. And the rest of, all, rest of us that morning were all expecting the police to turn up and handcuff one of our elders and take him off somewhere. This billboard, you see, was undermining the work we were doing in our church amongst asylum seekers and refugees, and both of them didn't like it. 
Now, I'd forgotten about that for many years, but as I was preparing and praying for today, God really brought it to my attention again. Why? And I genuinely feel this. I feel God wants you, Christ Church Birmingham, to be billboards of the gospel in this city, in this nation, and the nations. That's a big deal. So with that in mind, let's read, uh, spirit, uh, let's read Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the, venge and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. There will, a promise, be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long gone and devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And hear this. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. I pray, Spirit of God, as I speak to you today, I pray, Lord God, that you are our teacher. I pray, Lord God, that you lift our hearts to the great call of God on our lives. I pray, Lord God, that nobody here counts themselves out from being a Christian three months to being a Christian 33 years. I pray, Spirit of God, whatever the barriers are, I pray you remove them in Jesus' name so that everyone plays their part in the kingdom work that you've called us to do. In <coughs> Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this uh, passage is describing my home church's name, Jubilee. What was Jubilee? Well, Jubilee was a special year when God's people would set all their servants free. They would cancel all the debts for whatever reason. And it would be a great, amazing time of rejoicing, ju uh, justice, celebration, and unity. Can you imagine it? Everything set free. A huge billboard, if you like, with this is the year of the Lord's favor written all over it. And then approximately 600 years from Isaiah, um, this becomes Jesus' staggering kingdom manifesto, his billboard. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, Jesus says. It's all about me. Now, what you're probably most familiar, for those of you who might have read this passage many times in the past, is the first part. Proclaiming the good news to the poor, binding up the brokenhearted, um, setting captives free, and so on. But what has really got my attention over the last few years is the latter half. The bit where it talks about strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you together will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. Not just a handful of priests and ministers, but the multicolored, diverse, beautiful, multicultural priesthood of all believers from every type and every nation. That's what God is doing. That's the big idea this morning. Church is not for your entertainment, even though the worship was brilliant this morning. Hands up if you're the church, by the way. Yep. Church is not for your entertainment. You're the key players. You're the priesthood of all believers. And today, that's what I'd like to uh, unpack a little. So firstly, what was the priesthood in ancient times? Now, I don't know if you, uh, I, don't know what you'd, I don't know what you'd think about if I was to ask you the question, what is the most dangerous job there is? You might think it might be yours. I don't know. Um, what occupation would be the scariest thing to do? Here's a few. The first one, Alaskan crab fishing. I bet you wouldn't have came up with that. This is actually the most dangerous job in America. 
Uh, these guys have to fish in cold, cramped living conditions, fizz, uh, f- um, fishing conditions, crazy sea waves, icy decks. You're 26 times more likely to get injured or die doing this than working on the checkout at Aldi. <laughs> all for, and all for a crab sandwich. How about this one? Cleaning the windows of the tallest buildings in the world. Yikes, for those of you who don't like heights. These guys have literally got their marigolds on and are abseil washing the Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai where they set off all the fireworks. Scary. Check out this one. These guys might look like clowns. That's because they are clowns. They're called rodeo clowns. And these crazy people get paid loads as they distract raging bulls so that bullfighters can get out of the ring. Now, I I know we don't like bullfighting in this country, and we shouldn't. Um, Here's another one. I don't think there's any students here, so it's okay. Uh, These are students of Birmingham University, and that's pretty dangerous too. (laughs) And I think you're about to try and bring some of them into this church, so watch out. Why am I telling you all this? For no reason whatsoever. No, there is a reason. Um, In the Old Testament, if you were to ask the same question, priests would be high up there on the list. So what did priests of ancient Bible times do? Well, firstly, they offered, offered sacrifices. Very dangerous. This is probably what they were most well known for. They were the ones, no one else, who were allowed to approach the tent of meeting where God's holiness and wonder dwelt and pass through a curtain six feet high and three inches thick, a sign of God's perfect and majestic unapproachability. And on the other side of this curtain, they would make atonement for the people, offering meticulously prepared animal sacrifices, no shortcuts, massive attention to detail, in order to transfer God's righteous judgment away from the Israelites for all of their failings onto a spotless lamb. And it was dangerous. There's a story in Leviticus 10 where Nadab and um, uh, Abihu, who were the eldest sons of Aaron, the great priest, they were taken out by God's fire because they didn't do it properly. A big responsibility. God is holy and not to be messed with. Secondly, priests also had direct access to God. They would come before God after a whole load of ceremonial washings and cleansings in order to represent the people before God and represent God before the people. It was a serious job. There's another scary story about this in Numbers 16 when the judgment of God is falling on Israel and Aaron the priest somehow has to stop it. It says, so Aaron ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. Sounds like a bit like Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, doesn't it? Being a priest was treacherous. Priests also blessed the people. That was one of the perks of the job. They brought the reality, the presence, the prophetic voice often, the joy, celebration, the awe of God to the people he loved. And finally, they prayed. They prayed for Israel. And so this priestly tradition and practice continued for centuries until Jesus came. By then, the whole system was corrupt and controlling. Jesus confronted it many times. It turns out that Jesus had had come to transform and restore it, actually. And so on the cross, something phenomenal happened. As Jesus breathed his last, we read about it in Matthew 27, at that moment, the curtain of the temple, six feet high, three inches thick, was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. Everything changed. A way had now been opened through Jesus for all people to come to God without having to go through specially chosen priestly people or structures or rules and regulations or robes or collars that had gone before. 
Leadership was still important, but a leadership that knelt down in the dust and washed people's feet. Everything was different. As Peter 1, 2 tells us, you, hands up if you're the church, you, you are now a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Gospel billboards, the church. That's what Isaiah 61 is promising, isn't it? The poor, the brokenhearted, the uh, the blind, the captives, the prisoners, from every background and ethnicity, all of you, all of us, shall be named priests of the Lord. This is grace through and through. The unearned, unmerited favor of God. A gift to the world. So what does that look like? What are the priests of Christ Church Birmingham in action look like? Well, suddenly, what was the responsibility of a few priests of old now becomes the responsibility of all of us, every one of us. Firstly, we all still sacrifice in all sorts of ways. It's great to see so many of you from different nations here this morning. It's a sign of God's spirit in the church, but it doesn't happen by accident. Malawian theologian Harvey Kuyani, in the context of building churches with with people from the nations and cultures, says this, this is a complex and confrontational journey. (laughs) We had a full day about it yesterday with different people. Priests in this kind of church have to be courageously humble, all of you. You have to have a a willingness to absorb some of the things that are not dear to you, but are precious. (coughs) Sorry, I'm losing my voice. (coughs) You have to have a willingness to absorb some of the things that are not dear to you, but are precious to those coming in or those who are different from you. That's a sacrifice. It it might actually mess up your comfortable experience of church. And praise God, it should. Just like God welcomed you into his family, even though you were oceans apart, you welcome others. James Forbes, the first um, African-American minister to lead a multi-ethnic church, writes this. A truly diverse congregation where any body enjoys more than 75% of what's going on is not thoroughly integrated. So an integrating church is characterized by the need to be content with less than total satisfaction of anything. Mushtaba back home in Iran was, um, my friend Mushtaba was brought up to (laughs) generationally hate Afghans. When he came to faith in his when he came to faith there in Jubilee, he was surrounded by them, especially in his midweek community group. Funnily, God also gave him a job working with even more of them. He had to for the money. You see, God had another plan. As the power of the gospel started to take hold of his life, and he saw Jesus' amazing grace to him more and more, he gradually grew to see his Afghan brothers and sisters with God's eyes of love and how he now leads our Middle Eastern work amongst these brothers and sisters. God turns things around. Priests make sacrifices. What else do priests do in action? Well, they still, we still represent God to the people. You see, we have a problem. I don't know if you know that. We worship an invisible God. And that makes him all too easy to ignore in the day-to-day. I live near an industrial coastline. Uh, and on the way to work, sometimes I see those giant um, shipping containers along T-Sport. And I often wonder, what on earth is in them? Diamonds, slippers, frozen kebabs, puff puff, samosas, clothes. Who knows? I don't know. I can't tell from the outside. They all look different too, don't they? Different colors, often battered and dented and scrappy. Yet despite looking like that on the outside, what makes them valuable and precious and unique is what they carry on the inside. 
Listen, if you're from another nation, the Spirit of God is powerfully dwells in you. I shouldn't have to say that. He raised you to new life, along with the rest of everybody else in this church. Therefore, God wants you to mirror more and more of God to all of this church. Jesus, let me put it differently, Jesus' church is deficient without you. We can't see the fullness of God without you expressing your faith in the way God has newly birthed in you. Peter at Pentecost declared, I will pour my spirit on all people. All people. And listen, brothers and sisters, when God does that, he doesn't want to change you into Westerners. That is not the aim. That is not the target. My friend Mariama prays for everything. From laying hands on broken cars to wars and sickness in church and in her care home. She prays. And and the more she prays, the more she sees God move. Others see God move through her and ask her the question, who is this God you're praying to? Over lockdown, she prayed for the the 205 uh, care home residences in in, in the place she worked not to die of covid Often in tongues, despite the tragic statistics in many of the care homes around her her nursing home and in our area, not one person died of COVID in that time. As the relatives um, and the care staff noticed the power of God in her, they started praying with her too on a daily basis. And a lot of them weren't even Christians. Phenomenal. As I alluded to earlier and as uh, Steve and Corby mentioned, we, re- released, we recently purchased this uh, building. We never had a building for 25 years. We got it on our Silver Jubilee, and Steve and Joe were there. We had to raise 150k. We had never raised 150k, nowhere near. If I'm really honest with you, I was bottling it. How on earth could this happen? So we gathered the church to pray. But in those morning prayer meetings with Ghanaians and Tanzanians and Iranians and Nigerians and Indians and South Africans, who were much more used to relying on God than I was, we encountered his rest and certainty. I saw faith rise in the room and me. In fact, if I'm really honest, those few prayer warriors in that room taught me how to pray in this situation because I'd never been there before. Men and women from all, of, all over the world taking God at his word, taking the character of God seriously, praying in tongues. They believed in God's abundant supply. They saw the provision of God come to pass well before it did. And in all of that, they prayed faith into me. We raised 169K on that morning of the gift day. No loans, no borrowing. God was true to his word, faithful. As priests in action, so we all sacrifice, don't we? As priests in action, we all still represent uh, God to people through miraculous stuff as well as our serving in our lives. And thirdly, as priests in action, we are still called to be a blessing to everyone. In Jeremiah 29, in the midst of the people of God being exiled out of their promised land to the pagan godless uh, Babylon, God booms out these shocking words. I'm sure you remember them. He says in Jeremiah 29, 4, this is what the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I see that in just, just visiting the pantry, that was a moment of worship for me this morning. Just visiting and seeing what you guys are doing. That, that word from Jeremiah was shocking then and it's shocking now. You see, subconsciously we're thinking and praying, Lord, I'm a Christian, get me out of here. <laughs> oh, wait. When actually God wants all of us to be in Babylon, a blessing to Babylon. The tension is that we don't just melt in. That's the deal. God, get deeply involved at all levels, God says. Culturally, socially, economically, faithfully, financially, but still be that light 
that shines differently, swimming against the tide. It's complex. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. Those of you from different nations or different backgrounds um, might want to keep your distance a little because you're not used to that kind of thing. But on the other hand, God has called you, I believe, to be reverse missionaries in this nation, in this church, Before this nation sent sent white people to far-flung corners of the world to spread the word, on the back of that sinful humanity, as always, turned that missionary zeal into oppression and slavery. We can't turn back the clock. But friends, brothers and sisters, this is your day. This is your day. You can't do it from afar. God has placed you right in the center of Babylon. Being reverse missionaries will be tough. There will be lots of distractions, lots of sounds, as we heard earlier. You'll be chasing many things for a better life. And I understand that. I get it. When my parents came to the UK, they had nothing. We as followers through Jesus have everything, though. We have everything. Listen to the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. We press on towards that prize. That's the focus. And finally, as the priesthood of all believers, we pray. Jeremiah prays. And and, uh, Jeremiah says, pray for it. Pray for what? Pray for Babylon. We can boldly pray confidently pray, not just wimpy prayers, wimpy prayers, if it be thy will, do whatever you like, God, I don't care. Not that kind of prayer. No, we prevail with God, don't we? We grapple, we're specific. We come through with God in everything. Nothing is impossible with God. So these are some of the ways that we get to be priests in action. It's an exciting adventure. The church is an amazing place. Are you equipped? Are you strong enough? Are you ready? Probably not. Probably not. The band can come up. That would be great. Thanks. This priestly role that we were all involved with will entail insults, financial costs, steps of faith, hardships, battles, casualties, setbacks. The enemy will be all over it. How do we get through? How do we follow the great... Uh, how, do we, uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we make this happen in our lives? Well, we follow the great high priest, or kek or che, or ke or che. Is that, is that my king of kings, did someone say? Or ke or che. Jesus Christ was up on the cross, hurting, bleeding, dying, looking down at the people forsaking him, denying him, betraying him, and in the greatest act of love in the universe, he stared. He stared. Listen, this is the comfort. This is the strength. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly and press on with faith firmly. Jesus is doing Jesus is doing all of this, all of this through the church, through a new and better priesthood of all believers, the spirit-filled community of God. Hands up if you're the church, yes. you and me. You and me. Let's stand.